I know a great deal about death. As a young missionary, I lived for many years in a country that was torn apart by war. In that time, 23,000 people died. Sometimes to get the mail, I would have to walk over a dead body. The beauty of man is destroyed by death. The hope of all men destroyed by death. In my family, it has been torn apart by death. My brother was killed when he was six years old. My father died in my arms in the middle of a field. And a few years ago, I preached the funeral of my sister. I know much about death, but death is too strong of an enemy to overcome. No matter how much you wrestle him, no matter how much you fight against him, no matter how much you live in self-denial that he is not going to knock on your door, know this, that he is coming for you. And there is nothing you can do about it. As David said, there is but a few steps between me and death. Within just a few years, some of you will be dead. Within 25 years, many more of you will be dead. No. And with a hundred years, not only all of us will be dead, but we will be forgotten. All our hopes will be crushed. Every memory of whatever we have done will be erased. And of all creatures, we are most pitiful. Because not only is death coming for us, we know it. You know it. And you know it. You do everything in your power to push it out of your thoughts. But he's coming for you. Maybe even this evening. He's coming for your children. And there's nothing you can do. But there is one who has faced death head on. There is one, a mighty warrior, who went into death's stronghold and defeated him in his strongest place. There is one who has overcome man's greatest enemy. His name is Jesus Christ. And he bore the sins of the world. And he died upon a tree. And He paid for the very thing that is the cause of our death. And on the third day, the Father raised Him from the dead. And on the third day, the Holy Spirit raised Him from the dead. And on the third day, He raised Himself from the dead. And now the smallest, weakest believer can look death right in the face and say, Oh, death, where is your victory? Grave, where is your sting? sin where is your power you who have devoured nations you will devour no more you see the gospel is good news great news God is crying out to you about it did not Paul the Apostle himself say I am pleading with you but it is though God is pleading with you through me why will you live a life that has no meaning why will you live a life that literally is going to fall apart? Why will you allow yourself to be swallowed up by death? Why don't you come to Christ? What is holding you? What is this thing that has control of your mind and your heart? Come to Christ. You say, oh, it's too good to be true. It is true. You say, oh, I'm too great a sinner. You are not greater than the Christ, are you? You do not have more power than His grace, do you? Come to Him. Do you want to know what your profession of faith in Jesus Christ is worth? Your confession of faith in Him, what it's worth? The answer is this. It's worth absolutely nothing. It's worth absolutely nothing. They come to Him on that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in Your name, and in Your name cast out demons, and in Your name perform many miracles? Their defense before the Lord of glory is their own works. Would a true Christian, illuminated by the Holy Spirit, to know the depravity of his own heart, do you think he would actually give good works as a defense as to why the Lord should let him into heaven? Depart from me, I never knew you. When he speaks about few finding eternal life, he's talking about those, those who profess his name. Among those who call Jesus Lord, Few of them will find eternal life. 
So what we hear here is not everyone who says to me, Lord, will enter in the kingdom of heaven. No, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And what he's saying is, not everyone who emphatically declares me to be Lord will enter into the kingdom of heaven. This is not some secret discipleship here. This is not some hidden thing. This is a person who would emphatically say, yes, I'm, I'm a Christian. He says, not everyone who says this will enter into the kingdom of heaven, which is synonymous with not everyone who says this is truly Christian. No matter how emphatically someone declares themselves to be Christian, it is not the test of whether their Christianity is true. What is the test? We go on and we see this. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Now, he is in no way teaching a works salvation. Not at all. He is not teaching that men enter into the kingdom of heaven by their ability to perform the will of God. That is not what he's teaching. If you think that, you're putting the cart before the horse. What he's teaching is simply this. Those who have truly believed do so by the power of the Holy Spirit by which they've been regenerated and made new creatures. Through this miraculous work of salvation and the continuing work of the Holy Spirit in their life, their lives and manner of living are changed. And so that the true Christian is Christian by believing in Jesus, but you know he truly believes in Jesus because of the changes in his life. And those changes are marked by conformity to the will of God. Whenever someone does not understand the gospel in the New Testament, it is squarely laid at their feet, the fault of it. You understand that? It's very, very important. Because we understand, for example, in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, something very important, that men restrain the truth. They hold it down. They do not want to understand it. Because of their enmity against God and their desire to live free from His rule. Men are known to be Christian by the fruit that they bear. And throughout the history, since the Reformation and on at least, it was greatly emphasized that yes, we should and can have assurance and great joy at the moment of our conversion, but that immediate assurance may be only apparent and there is a necessity to look for ongoing fruit in the life of the believer. Because the evidence that we are disciples, as we found out last night in John chapter 8, is that we continue on in His Word. And that we bear fruit, according to chapter 15 of John, and fruit that remains. So, in no way is Jesus teaching that salvation is the result of our ability to conform to the will of God. What He is teaching is simply this, a man that has truly been converted regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit will be a new creature who will live a different way. You will see the evidence of conversion in their life. Now, let's step back again. Something very, very important. The believer's life is not a continual upgrade in a sense without any obstacle in it. It, it doesn't go so much like this as a true believer's life goes kind of like this. We do struggle with sin. We do have setbacks. We, we can go through many a troubling time. But what does the Bible guarantee us for the true believer? That he who began a good work will finish it? And that the Father is constantly disciplining those whom He loves. And we see here that salvation is not simply the work of the Son or the Spirit, but is also the work of the Father especially in regard to sanctification. In John chapter 15, verse 1, I am the true vine and my Father is the vine dresser. He's the one who takes care of the vine. Now listen to what he says. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Who takes away? The Father takes away. Now, just exactly where does he take them? Verse 6. 
Anyone does not abide in me is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. There is absolutely no such a thing as a continuously carnal Christian or a continuously barren Christian or a fruitless Christian. It does not exist. Everyone, I know Jesus. Well, that's wonderful. Does he know you? Everybody wants to go to heaven. They just don't want God to be there when they get there. But I want to tell you something. You don't want to go to that nasty old hell, do you? What, are you trying to get them saved based on self-preservation? You set a field on fire and every venomous snake in that field will run away from that fire, but when it does, it's still a venomous snake. The question is not, do you want to go to heaven? Or do you want to escape hell? The question is, has God so worked in your heart that you want God? Has God so worked in your heart through the gospel that I've preached to you that the sin you once loved, you now hate? The question is not, do you want to go to heaven? Because as I said, everybody wants to go to heaven. The devil would like to go back to heaven as long as he didn't have, didn't have to bow his knee to God. Do you see that you have no merit in yourself? And that the only way to God is through the virtue and the merit of Christ and what He did for you on that tree. Yes, I can see that. Can you cast yourself upon Him? Forsaking everything. Repenting even of good deeds. Brother Paul, what do you mean repenting of good deeds? Repenting, turning away from trusting in your own good deeds and throwing yourself upon Christ alone. Not everyone who confesses with their mouth, Lord, Lord, will be saved. What is the motivation for being holy? Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. Many times you come to see that you're walking in a place you shouldn't be walking or living in a way you shouldn't be living and immediately condemnation comes upon you and that condemnation drives you farther away from, from Christ. You feel ashamed, you feel like it's, it's a works idea of well I've got to you know, get my life fixed, do this and everything and then kind of earn some brownie points and then come back. And we have so much old covenant teaching and do not realize about the new covenant. Some things that are so beautiful. Christ really did pay it all. He really did pay it all. And when you come to the realization the Holy Spirit has convicted you in your heart that you're wrong, you should not be listening then to the devil who begins condemnation and everything else and tries to drive you further and further away from the Savior. When the Lord tells you you're wrong, He says also, He says it like this, He goes, you're wrong. I love you. Come back. You're wrong. You are without spot before me. Come back. I love you. You want to know what happens when a believer sins? God continues to love them. God continues to woo them. God continues to come after them. God continues to draw them. Let me give you an example. Let's say that God wants me to fast, pray, and read the Word all morning. But I want to go out to my wood shop and work. According to many fundamentalist pastors, this is what's going to happen. God's going to stand there and say, Well, you just go ahead and go to your workshop if you want, but I'm not going with you. And by the way, I hope you cut your fingers off. You know what really happens? I'll tell you what happens. I go out to that workshop. God is screaming at me. I love you, Paul. I love you. Nothing will change that. Come away with me. I'm looking for a board. He goes over there with me and helps me find it. He said, Paul, here's the board. But I love you. Come away with me. I turn on that power saw. He guards my fingers. And when I look across that saw at the other side of it, he's standing there going, Paul, I love you. I love you. I love you. Come back with me. A bruised reed, he will not break. And a burning wick, he will not put out. What does that mean? It means this, my dear friend. Well, you go down to Israel, and, and there the children would cut cane. There's just thousands and millions of cane growing everywhere. And they would cut cane, and they would, they would make a flute out of it. But as they were making the flute with the cane, the, the flute would sometimes just break, because cane is very fragile. 
Well, they wouldn't try to fix the flute. They'd throw it away and get another piece of cane. There's all kinds of cane where that one came from. No sense working with that. Just throw it away and start all over again. That's not the way God works. God, God selects a piece of cane, begins to work with it, play beautiful music on this thing. And then for the fractures and the failure and the cane itself, it breaks. God doesn't take that broken belief and throw him out and say, well, I you know, I'll get someone else. I got plenty where this guy came from. He'll take it and he'll mend it again, mend it again, and mend it again. How many times have I broken my own life and God has put it back together? That, that compels me to want to be holy. Have you ever been in a house where it's just lamps, no electricity? In Peru, in the jungle, that's what we had. And we would have lamps. And if that oil ever runs out of that lamp and that wick begins to burn, my dear friend, when that wick begins to consume, it will smell horribly. It begins to burn because there's no longer any oil. And it stinks. And what you do is you just take the thing, open up the window and throw it outside. It stunk up the whole house. The thing that was supposed to give light has done nothing but stink up everything when Christ begins to work with a believer and fills them with the oil of His Spirit and they grieve the Holy Spirit through sin and the wick begins to burn and the Christian begins to stink and it's nothing but the smell of burning flesh. Christ doesn't take that, throw it out the window and say, well, I can get another lamp. But He begins again pruning and cleaning and preparing and then filling once again. What is the motivation for being holy? The way God sees you in Christ. He says, Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes. It's talking about when you look at me. Literally, my heart beats faster when you look at me. Is this true? Does it really mean that every time I give a heaven glance every time I look towards my father in heaven his heart beats faster do you see that does that not excite you does that not encourage you to pray does that not encourage you to keep your eyes on him that every time I look to the father his heart is ravished Every time I look, my little boy, when I get home, I just look and when he peeks around that door and looks at me, I am just on fire. You see, you think most of the time you go to God and he's like, just, well, I got to listen to him. That's the covenant. I got to stay here. If you're a believer, every time you turn your eyes upward in prayer, the Father's heart beats faster. He is so full of divine joy. He so awaits your glance. That makes me want to just stop preaching right now and go pray. And then he says this, look what he says. He says, ravished my heart with one of thine eyes, with one chain of thy neck. With a necklace, literally. I'm mesmerized by the beauty of that necklace you have on. And what would that be? But grace? What would that be? The very gifts. He says, the very gifts I gave you when I see them. They ravish my heart. Oh, my dear friend, if you could own, I don't know if you're, if you're even, you might just totally disagree with me on this. I don't know, but if you could only see what I'm saying here. That when you bow your knee to prayer, when you bow your knee to pray, when you look up, when you're walking down the street, when you're in Walmart, wherever, and you give that upward glance, Father, it ravishes his heart. And when he looks down at you, he sees only that which he has given you. Grace upon grace and mercy upon mercy. Don't you want to be holy? Don't you want to pray? If things are such as the Bible says, doesn't that change everything? What is the motivation, is the motivation for being holy?